Awesome. Hey, hey, y'all. You probably recognize my face. I've been here once or twice. Um, I was very honored to be invited by Sophia to come and talk and, and interview Monica today. And we got to catch up yesterday um, just to make sure we were on the same page. And I learned a few things about you, Monica. I learned, especially just now, you, you consider yourself a science-minded person. Is that right? Are you intimidated by be sitting in front of this room full of creatives? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I happened to meet Sophia at a neighborhood event, the Charlestown Mothers Association. And we were focused on working mothers. And I, I wanted to learn more about how to update my LinkedIn profile. And we got to talking. And she's like, hey, you know, considering the work that you do, we'd love to invite you to come and talk about some environmental sustainability issues. And we're going to be focused on water. Would you be interested? And I was like, absolutely. I got home. And I was like, I don't know what I did. <laughs> I was just like, I, I'm science minded. I'm going to be in a room full of creatives. I don't have a creative bone in my body. And I'm wondering, how am I going to be able to translate some of these scientific issues and challenges into a way that's meaningful for, for everyone to have an impact? So. But I learned this morning that that's not actually true. You do have a creative bone in your body. You're a cellist. <laughs> I was a cellist. Was a cellist. OK, well, hold on. I played, uh, I didn't listen to your question. So I, I played the cello all throughout childhood. I don't know how many of you here play an instrument. And um, so when you were introduced in elementary school, right, they, they pulled out, it usually starts with strings. I wanted the cello because to me it sounded like chocolate. I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> I just loved the rich sound of the cello and I was proud to lug around this big instrument. And I played all the way through elementary, middle school, high school, and to college. Now I have children and I had to sell my cello when my youngest was born because it's worse you know, to have it sit there and go unused and you know, have to clean it and worry about it than to have somebody else utilize it. But this past uh, week and a half ago, I bought an electric cello. <laughs> and I'm inspired to do the 100-day challenge to practice five to 10 minutes every day to get back into it. So We, we got a convert, <laughs> everybody. So, um, so water is obviously such an important part of life. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the real challenges and problems that we're facing? Um, <sighs> regarding yeah. water, health, sustainability, et cetera? Yeah, so I think um, when you think about water, I don't want to go over w what many of us already know. But for folks who are just dipping their toes into it, um, two thirds of the earth is covered with water. But only 3 to 4% of that is fresh water. And of that 3 to 4%, depending on which statistic you're reading, less than 1% is consumable by rivers and lakes as the majority is locked into polar ice and snow. And I think it's important when we think about humans, and it's been estimated when, you, when we look at our populations, 80% of humans live within 60 miles of a coastline of an ocean, a river, a lake. Half a billion, over half a billion people owe their livelihoods directly to water, and two thirds of the global economy is derived from activities that involve water, right? So I noticed um, as we were marketing the event for today, there were some statistics. Um, and depending on who you, which statistic you're reading, 60 to 70% of our body is water. And we need it for many reasons. Uh, to, to create saliva, mucosal membranes. You know, I'm not going to get into the, all of the um, toxin excrement and so forth, but it's highly important to us. And. Um, a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to read this book called Blue Mind. So for anyone who's into reading more about water and water issues, this book, when you, think, when you look at it, the premise is basically shows how being on, near, in, or underwater can actually make you happier, healthier, more connected, and better at what you do. And in that book, I read a, um, a, a saying, thousands have lived without love. No one has lived without water. And uh, so I'd begin by looking at the global macro issues. And there are two ways in which I define it. There's water scarcity and water quality. And what under water scarcity, we can look at the definitions as you know, everything having to do with sanitation, hygiene, water insecurity. Um, but we can't really talk about water without talking about climate change, right? Because a lot of this is being affected um, by climate change. I asked if I could read just a small excerpt from a poem. Absolutely. I heard back in 2015, I was fortunate enough to be in Paris during COP21. 
there was a side conference focused strictly on health and climate and how health advocates, public health advocates, health systems, hospitals could, could be more engaged in this topic. And I heard Sophia Walker. I don't know if any of you have heard of Sophia Walker. She's a British poet. And um, she basically shared with us um, a message using spoken word. And I'm going to read it for you if that's OK, and then jump into this. There aren't many things that make all humans the same, like the way we cope with change. Some people would risk everything for everything to stay the same. But you can't risk everything when it's already at stake. Some of us embrace the possibilities in change. Now progress is impossible if everything remains. For years, I kept saying, I believe in human ingenuity. In ingenuity, I never accepted the crisis. Always felt our scientists would get us out of it. Invent some last minute miracle fix. At the same time, scientists were urging us to wean ourselves off of our carbon addiction. My response was to believe so much in scientific wisdom, I didn't need to change anything about the way I was living. I wasn't listening. None of us were listening. When we're told the conditions we'll be living in, it's terrifying. So we find ourselves distancing, witnessing in a passive way, not engaging for now. Climate change is miles away for Western nations. What for me is someday is right now in places they and they won't face this alone. The danger with this change is its scope. We all know the butterfly effect. The smallest of incidents becomes a catalyst. The tiniest events can be cataclysmic. You're wondering what the relevance to climate change is. Well, in Syria, there was a drought. So you see, we aren't just talking about the weather. See, this woman, she exists to say we aren't pretending. So you can imagine this, but just acknowledge she exists a million times over if we want the truth of it. This woman is Syrian, but she could be anywhere. She and her husband are farmers. Since 2006, they've been desperate for water, and now it's 2009. 1.5 million farmers, and these are real statistics, 1.5 million farmers have already fled the countryside. Syrian cities destabilize because at the same time, Iraqi refugees have already caused an urban population crisis. No water means lack of food, lack of resources, a pressured government. By 2015, we have millions of refugees and other nations intervening. Not to speak simplistically, but it started with a drought that followed a century's worth of downward change in the amount of rain. Researchers say that drought was climate change. So we aren't just talking about the weather, we're speaking about a woman. And I was reminded about this poem a couple of weeks ago. I follow this, um, this group uh, called Triple Pundit. If for anyone who's interested in reading more on sustainability issues, uh, related to environmentalism, social responsibility. And there was an article, an article that pretty much outlined what I just stated in that poem. And it began with those statistics. So we heard about those statistics from 2015, and then today we're hearing that too many water distressed places, up to 75% of people's water needs remain unmet. Urgent is action is needed in order to reach nearly 2 billion people who still drink unsafe water. And from there, they started to outline the humanitarian crisis, all due to water insecurity. And so when we think about water at a macro global level, level, I don't know how many of you might be aware that one in nine people around the world lack access to safe water. So imagine one in nine of us here, and that's 844 million people. How many of you here within your art studio or at home in your garden or in your children's playroom have a five gallon bucket? I do. Have it? Imagine how how long do you think you could carry that bucket full of water? Not too far, because it's it's really heavy. By the way, eight, a gallon of water is like eight pounds or something. Yeah, oh, crazy. Um, but um, anyway, women and children in the globe, across the globe, on average, walk 3.7 miles for their water every single day. I told you I'd make you sad and scared. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to scare you too much, but I think it's, we need to hear this, and I think there, it's an important topic, and I'm going to really bring it down home to Boston as well. But around 35% of hospitals and health centers don't have water. It's a matter of life or death for women and children. Globally, 28 workers die every hour due to communicable and genital unit genital urinary diseases, most of them water and sanitation related. 
and more than 700 children die every day from diarrhea linked to water and sanitation. And this is the less developed countries. Are you, you, must, you may or may not have heard Cape Town has pushed back their date water, day zero, to 2019. Day zero is when the municipality will be turning off the water and where residents will have to form up in a queue for their daily rations. This is a developed city. And nationally, when we think about the United States, in just this past December, the EPA uh, unveiled its proposal to replace the 2015 Clean Water Rule, also known as WADAS, WODAS, Water of the United States. What's interesting is this proposal uses a very narrow and unscientific, unscientific definition, and it's peeling back the protections from wetlands and other water sources. We have droughts. We were just talking, you're from LA. There are droughts across California. I'm sure many of you may have read, or if you hadn't, there are communities that every day potable water is being brought in, and there's no end in sight. This is in California, in the United States. And then we think about water contamination. We've got the Hudson River Valley. We have Flint, Michigan. We have West Virginia that sued DuPont for polluting the, the water uh, due to the, to, the, to the creation of Teflon. And there was just some justice recently in that the state of uh, Minnesota was able to get $850 million from 3M because of the water pollution that they had created up in Minnesota, creating things like nonstick foodware. And I don't want to get on chemicals, but don't, don't buy that. <laughs> um, so I started state, but there's also New England. New England, we have our own set of issues, and here within the state of Massachusetts. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, there, were, there were plumbing uh, fixtures that were laced with a neurotoxin, and that chemical leached into the water of everyone who drank it and bathed with it. And what's interesting, and this was all because people complained about the smell and the taste of their water. And so wh what I find especially interesting is more than half of the new more than half of those water pipes sprayed with a contaminant that leaches into our waterway was sprayed within Massachusetts in the Cape Cod region. And today there's new studies that have revealed that exposure to that poison has increased the risk for stillbirths and other pregnancy complications. 2016, who remembers that drought here in Massachusetts? I had a farm share. We missed our, our share one week because they weren't able to harvest. But in 2016, the cities of Worcester, Ashland, and Cambridge had to switch over to the MWRA because they didn't have enough water within their reservoirs to supply for their citizens. And then this past February, we're learning that uh, firefighting foam is linked to water contamination here in the state. So what's supposed to, you know, we're thinking about this intersection of public health and public safety, but um, back in 2012, 2013, they started testing the soil around firefighting training stations. And what they realized is these perfluorinated chemicals, which have a high bond, will go into the soil, bind into soil. But then when water is poured on them or it's raining, that goes down into the groundwater, therefore contaminating our drinking water. And this is in, in Massachusetts. Um, I, I have a tip sheet to test your water that people can walk away with. Um, and then this, this past month, Quincy EPA uh, wa was filed a lawsuit against the city of Quincy for polluting the Boston Harbor with sewage discharge. Last really sad statistic focused on Boston. Who here lives in Boston? I live in the, the neighborhood of Charlestown. I have two kids. One is in uh, Boston Public School. Did any of you know that in Boston Public Schools, 74% of our children don't have access to drinking water? I see some head nods. Yeah. So while we source our water from a near pure aquifer, just outside near Worcester, out there, unfortunately, we have a really old antiquated plumbing system. And that plumbing system will deposit lead into the water. And so I applaud the city of Boston for being transparent that it's shut off water and it doesn't, the, the drinking fountains don't work. They bring in a big Poland Springs jug and bottled water. But we have this issue here in the city of Boston with regard to water quality. And in 2013, when there was another minor heat wave, a lot of the students that came in to study, there was a shortage of water. 
and people were getting sick in our own schools. And that's, that was a disruption to education here in the United States in the city of Boston. But one-fifth of schools worldwide don't provide any toilet facilities. And 900 million school children across the world have nowhere to wash their hands to stop the spread of daily diseases. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we were warned that this was not going to be an uplifting <laughs> scenario to talk about. Um, Thank you for that. I mean, it's amazing that this is all going on. And I, you know, for me personally, like I don't know about 90% of that information. Um, yet I live in a country, city, and state where things are affected. It affects my water. Uh, so please tell me that you and your, your team at, at Blue Cross are doing something, uh, or at least working on programs or initiatives to help with these yeah. problems. Because that would make me feel really good right now. <laughs> So, um, so I happen to lead the sustainability program at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts. Many of you are probably wondering, what in the world is an insurer doing in environmentalism? Well, for us, yes. yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're. I think first off, I just want to quick introduce insurance because mm. I think it makes sense to see this the buildup. But Blue Cross Blue Shield is an affiliation, an association of affiliated insurance companies. I'm focused on supporting the work here within the state of Massachusetts. Uh, being in the state of Massachusetts, and, and much of this was created due to the way that healthcare is reimbursed. I mean, I'm not even gonna get into the fact uh, how healthcare is broken. Yes, and let's I'm, not do that today. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've already, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, I can only handle so much <laughs> this early on a beautiful Friday. <laughs> But we, we've fallen in love with the idea that healthcare is broken and we're looking for ways to fix it and innovate. And by being an association and working in Massachusetts, we're very fortunate to be the innovators of the Blues program. One in three Americans is insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I think it, it's nice to recognize that as an entity, we're looking at these issues. But within the state of Massachusetts, we're these guinea pigs and innovators for the rest of the Blues plans. So we were the first to offer same-sex insurance before it rolled out across the country. We were the first to offer insurance in a state with universal health care. We were the first insurance program to have an environmental sustainability lead. Why? Because wellness is our bottom line. We actually, as a company, do better when people are healthy. And many of you today might understand that in that if you're Blue Cross Blue Shield insured, you get reimbursed for your gym membership. And right now we're looking at the outputs, but we need to think about the inputs. But I'd love to hear from you if any tip, have any tips. Um, so at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts, we take a holistic approach to environmental sustainability. We recognize it's not gonna solve the opioid epidemic. It's not gonna solve death with dignity. It's not going to address the issues around mental wellness. But we do recognize that with a healthy environment, we have healthy people, population health. And so we're doing what we can to ensure that we have a positive impact through how we design, construct, operate, purchase, invest, and now looking at our member network. From a, from a very broad perspective, we have a sustainability program that's categorized and goals and targets that are categorized into four buckets climate and air, natural resources, food and chemicals. Our water goal falls under our natural resources bucket. And we've set out a plan that by 2020, we want to reduce our water consumption by 10% with the 2015 baseline. Just to, as of last year, we reduced it by 11%. So what, what are you doing? Like what <coughs> steps are you taking to actually implement those changes? You know, it's like, so I always hear like people are just like, oh yeah, by 2025, we're going to do yeah. this thing. And like, what are you doing practically to make that happen? So across our facilities, I mean, I could get into the engineering things, which might put half yeah, no, 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 people no. to sleep. Uh, but I'll just name off a couple of them that I think it's important. And you all have access to through a mass saves program, such as implementing low flow automatic water fixtures, low flow automatic toilets. But we also have some pretty uh, genius engineers who are really passionate about environmental sustainability as well, and just sort of solving problems. And um, they have created different ways to collect water condensation from our air handlers and redirect it to our buildings and grounds. See, at two of our South Shore facilities, we have community gardens, and we noticed an uptick in our water consumption with the community gardens because we're allowing, pe you know, we want people to grow fruits and vegetables and flowers. And so now we're using that gray water 
um, to do that. How many people here know that most businesses are charged for consumption as well as the effluent and discharge? Yeah, so a lot of people in our home bills, we, we recognize it based on our consumption and everything else is just sort of hidden. But as a business, we also have to monitor what we're putting back into the system. So not only are we making sure that we are redirecting that water where we can because we're charged for it, but we also want to make sure it's as pure as possible. So it sounds like there are a lot of creative ways to m make these changes. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, what are some creative ways that you um, bring into your daily, daily job, uh, daily life? Like, <laughs> how do you approach your job um, with creativity? Yeah. Um, so with regard to creativity, the way that I look at environmental sustainability, it's innovating business as usual to have that positive social environmental impact. But innovation really comes from creativity, the a positive mindset, the willingness to change. And uh, creativity for us, it fall, we use it in many forms for communication, be it written, orally, visually. I usually rely on others for that because I'm really good with Excel and the numbers, but I have a colleague of mine who takes just what, you know, a page of all these statistics and will sum it up into this beautiful image that can speak to everyone regardless of their perspective, their language, their, their how they might feel about the topic. So generally you don't have the opportunity to bring your cello to those creative <laughs> meetings? They don't want me to bring oh, the cello. <laughs> you don't want me. <laughs> So uh, you, you mentioned to me when we spoke earlier that you come from a family of folks who are uh, socially involved and environmentally involved. What, yeah. is the, what does dinner look like when you all get together? How are the conversations? Oh, gosh. Well, if, if one of us isn't crying or yelling, then it hasn't been a good dinner. <laughs> um, so I was raised, uh, born and raised in Wisconsin in a conservative, environmentally friendly uh, farming community. But my mother is also from Ecuador. And so as a child, we had the experience of traveling to her home country every, the, every other year. And we were faced with extreme poverty and understanding that this marginalized community was more deeply affected uh, through food injustice, energy democracy, environmental justice. And so what's interesting is, we, we were talking about this the other day, but there are four of us, of my siblings. And early on in our lives, we had very different political perspectives, but today we all are focused on social and environmental issues, be it within our role. And, um, and I think the yelling, screaming, and crying usually comes down to a difference of opinion and how we should go about doing it. My, sis yeah, my sister cries a lot. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> arguments over how it should be done the right way. How Not necessarily that like, you disagree on the whole scenario, the whole scene. Sometimes it's how we disagree. Sometimes it's how it should be done the right way. I think some people just get over very passionate about it, and so you have to appreciate that about them. And Absolutely. Yeah. And it's great that we have people like you and your siblings in the world, right, with their passions, focus on things that matter to all of us at the end of the day. So thank you for that. Oh, you. So I'm curious about ways um, that we in this room might be able mm -hmm. to make Capitalist. adjustments in our daily lives and tell our friends and tell their friends. And how can we change this process? So first off, thank you. Thank you for being interested in this topic. Thank you for committing to this work and committing to this work so that we can undo what we've done and give the people we care for and the generations that follow a true future, really. Um, I, I, brought, I created a list for you, so I'm gonna read off again. But um, what I think, you know, when I started to think about creatives and sustainability, there's a lot in common. I think creatives, and especially those in the more artistic corners, are often accused or branded as being elitist or out of touch. It's the same thing for environmental and sustainability advocates. And so just as creatives are accused of being elitist, the business people, a business that I'm in today, are accused of being unfeeling, cold, and focused on the bottom line. And I think it's really important to think that there are partnerships uh, to be made. We can pull valuable resources. We can reach wider audiences. We can strengthen the social, economic, and political capital that each entity brings to the table. And these are issues that we can come and collaborate and work on together. Um, artists and creatives can help build those bridges, earlier I mentioned, between the, the different perspectives. You help translate those ideas for people speaking different languages, different perspectives, different goals. And so I think on a daily basis, what I ask of you is to think about your creative process, 
the product that you're making. Think about the inputs that go into it and the outputs at the end of life, what's gonna happen to it. We're rebranding ourselves as a company and they, they recently asked me, well, what, do we put a leaf on it to show we're environmentally friendly? And I was like, no. I was like, well, what are we gonna be, you know, how are we branding ourselves? What's the color palette? You know, are we using any chemicals of concern? Make sure there's no styrofoam in anything that we do. At the end of life, can we recycle it? And um, I think that those are some of the same things that I would ask on a more functional, tactical level outside of the partnering and the collaboration. And then I also created a list which we can Which we will, we will definitely share the list. And I'll just quickly read nice. the top yeah, line. Please go for it. And um, because I, I think it, it's, I, I hadn't thought of this until I did the research myself. I didn't realize there were so many opportunities. So there's clean up wisely and reuse solvents. It has to do with uh, removing paint from brushes and recycling uh, the, the, the different solvents. Dispose of toxic materials properly. Limit the waste of paint. Choose green supply companies and safer materials. And many of you, I'm sure, are probably already doing this. Reuse supports and other materials. Cut down on paper, recycle it. I mean, not all this is directed to water, but this is more sustainability. But definitely the paint is, if you think about it, going into, it's basically the Boston Harbor. When it leaves this area through the MWRA, it goes out into Deer Island and then out to the harbor. Uh, but reuse packaging materials, limit energy and water consumption in the studio. When building or remodeling studio space, go green. Uh, repair and recycle, reduce gasoline consumption, and reduce mailings and shipping services. That's fantastic. So. Monica, thank you so much for your insights today. We're grateful to have a science-minded person <laughs> come sit in front of a bunch of creatives. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.